Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello again, I'm Frank Moriello, here with another edition of Colony Close-Up. Today I'm here with Steve Heider, who's chief of the Colony Police Department. Um, Steve, you were, uh, you were appointed as chief of the uh, police department back in uh, July of 2003. Mm -hmm. Since that time, there have been a number of changes, a number of Im improvements to the police department. Um, personnel is, is one area that, that we can talk about. Um, if, if we've had a number of officers retire in the last four years. Also, there have been a number of initiatives um, that we've undertaken during that time. So but what I want to do is, is first first part of the show, I'd, I'd like to, to talk about the personnel and, and the number of, uh, of changes we've had with our, with our personnel. If someone wants to be a police officer on the Colony Police Department, what do they have to do? What's the process? Well, essentially the process starts with a civil service exam. Um, they're offered typically every two years. We just offered one last December. Uh, so we're in the middle of that cycle, but it's typically every two years, always offered in December of the year. Uh, typically it's in cycle with the New York State offering of all police exams across the entire state. So it's uh, very regulated. It's uh, not the longest exam, it's about 75 questions. Very basic in terms of basic understanding of communities, uh, police work in general, not real specific. It just gives us a starting point. It gives us a list of names that we can start to draw from, and it puts everybody on level ground, so to speak, at the start of the process. Now, uh, typically, how many people usually take the exam? Well, the last time we had uh, almost 200 take the exam, and we've had it as low as 100, as many as 250. Uh, typically, uh, we have a wide range of types of people to take it. You know, it's people as young as 20 years old can take the test or as old as 34 years of age can take the test. So when we get a list uh, that's put out from the test, it's a pretty diverse list. Now what's the educational requirements? We're one of the few departments in the area, or even across the state, we require 60 credit hours of college. We think it's very important. We believe that uh, a lot of times people's writing skills are better, people's general Maturity level is oftentimes higher once they've had some college behind them. But when we look across the board and we look at the applications we receive, the majority of our candidates have bachelor's degrees, some have master's degrees. We're getting them from all different occupations. We have accountants on our police department. We have teachers. We've had a lawyer in the past. We have pharmacists on our police department. So it's a pretty wide range of very educated people. Um, when you have openings, um, obviously you would start at the top of the list. Uh, usually how many people do you think are canvassed for for maybe one or two positions? Well, it depends on the, it's, it's done uh, by block scoring. So you might have five people in the 100 block, 10 people in the 95, then 15 in the 90 block. And it depends how many people we're looking at. Now in the past we've uh, interviewed and gone through as many 25 or 30 people when we're looking at five people, five or six people. We typically want to probably a pool of about 10 candidates, even if we're only looking for one or two, because the test just gets you in the door. After that test comes out, we actually start to canvas people and they express their desire to move forward. We then expose them to a physical agility exam. Now, the requirements are actually given to them six weeks in advance, so they have plenty of time to prepare. But typically, we, use, we lose between 25 and 30 percent of the candidates because they can't pass a certain aspect of the physical exam. So. We know that in the process, we'll burn through about half the candidates between either medical problems, psychological problems, between the agility test and, between, and including the background investigation. So you do do a background investigation. How thorough is that investigation? The background investigation is the most vital investigation that we'll do throughout the hiring process. Uh, I always point to an example that occurred out in Los Angeles uh, City. It was back about six, seven years ago, they were having a mass hiring. They were having recruitment drives across the country. They were very short of people. They had problems getting people to want to come on a job. So they lowered their expectations of their candidates. And there's a gentleman by the name of Perez. And Perez had applied for a number of local police department jobs in the Los Angeles County area. Turned down by each and every one of them. Prior arrests, some bad um, vibes from interviews, no good references from former employers. And although all the little departments turned them down, Los Angeles took them against their advice. Within five years, 
Perez worked in the Rampart Division. That's the, always the famous division that all the police shows are about. And within five years, he had actually formed a gang of rogue police officers within that precinct. He ultimately was tried and convicted for murder of a drug dealer. They robbed drug dealers. They swindled people. They roughed up people. To date, they have paid over almost $200 million in, in claims of police abuse because of him and five other people. How could Los Angeles have saved $200 million? They could have put a 41 cent stamp on a rejection letter and asked them not to apply. And we use as an example when we have our detectives and they're the ones that do our background investigations, we want them to look in every single corner of a person's life. We know nobody's perfect. We know that people make mistakes. We looked at how they handled those mistakes, how their lives grew and matured from maybe when a mistake was made when they were young. But we want them to look at their personal lives, their work lives. We want them to look. They talk to former girlfriends, former boyfriends. They talk to everybody. And we're not looking for rumor or conjecture. We're looking to make sure that we get a candidate that fits the mold of what we view the Colony Police Department is and will serve the community well. Because that's at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Now, I understand you also do credit checks on these people. When we have them sign off on transcripts, we have them sign off on credit checks, we have them sign off on medical checks, because as an area of credit checks, it has been shown across the country through studies that typically in the police world, that if you start with a candidate that has poor credit, those kind of problems that existed, that created that poor credit, typically don't go away. And you can have problems with those kind of candidates later on. We're looking for people that maybe didn't, maybe they had a slight credit problem at one point. But again, when you can see that, okay, it was when they got out of college, they were stuck with loans. But you know, they made good on them. They got themselves out of the credit problem. That candidate will still move forward in the process. But we had a candidate within the last uh, four, within the last four years, that his credit was as bad as only 1% of the entire working population. He almost had no credit score. And that just doesn't lead to the integrity that we're looking for with people that we want to hire in our police department. Once, uh, once you've done the, the background checks, um, you do interviews. How many interviews do you typically do? Typically they go through two interviews. They go through a board interview, which is, it is a very daunting experience. You can imagine being led to a room with a table like this and a bucket of water on one side and a cup and you're sitting in front of seven people. And we try to keep our interview panel pretty varied too. We use patrolmen, we use sergeants, we use lieutenants, and a, and a deputy chief usually runs the, the interview process. But we also always bring in somebody from the community. It could be a school principal, it could be a school superintendent, somebody from the outside because we think it's very important to add the community element into the interview process. We need our community involved in the police department and we do it from the earliest stages that they get hired. Once they pass through that interview process, they're graded, so to speak. They're listed in, in a category of, say, one through 10 of uh, where they would fit into uh, being hired. Uh, and at that point, if we're looking for a candidate, we'll bring in one or two candidates then to do a final chief's interview where they sit down with myself, my two deputy chiefs. And it's technically a more relaxed interview than the first one uh, because we, we're not trying to put them on the spot. We're trying to find out more about them, to see how their personality is, to see if they can just have a conversation. And at that point, a decision is made whether or not to offer the employment. Once uh, you decide that you want to offer employment to an individual, where does it go from there? What's the next step? That the process, at that time, the process still isn't done. Um, at that point, even though the offer of employment is made, they have to still pass through a series of psychological exams and medical exams. And although we may not be able to preclude them based on them, depending on some minor conditions, um, it is still something that they have to pass through because they still have to prove to the town that they're physically and mentally capable of performing the job function. Um, if it's a, a minor problem along the way, that's something that we can make compensations for. But if they just physically can't or mentally can't or mentally challenged and can't, then at that point, then the offer of employment may be withdrawn. Okay, once, once they've gone through that, what's the next step? Uh, essentially then, it's for town board approval. You know, this whole process is done. 
um, at the start with discussions between myself, a town board liaison like yourself, uh, through this town supervisor's office we, in conjunction with the controller because obviously we have to make sure all the moons are in place to, to complete that hire. And that final step is when they actually appear before the town board uh, on a Thursday night and it, their appointment becomes official when only when that town board votes itself. And at that point, it's just the start of the process again. All our people have to go through the Zone 5 Regional Police Academy. It is not a sure thing. People sometimes do not pass it, although we've been very lucky all our candidates do, and they actually do quite well. It's a 25-week experience. It's run like a sort of a boot camp, very military uh, in terms of discipline, very high expectations and very high requirements, tremendous emphasis on not only academics, but on the physical uh, part of it. Um, we require people to go through this physical agility exam, partly because we know that we need to know that they're going to pass the basic school part of it. And they go through about 20 or out of the 24 weeks where it's running three miles a day. It's doing defensive taxes, tactics. It's doing all those things necessary to complete the physical part of the job. Um, in addition to that, there's typically um, training in firearms, uh, driver, uh, the driving portion is very challenging in terms of working on the different tracks, in terms of evasive maneuvers. They go through a very pretty deep segment on dealing with all the different kinds of people they're going to have to deal with in the course of a day in a police department. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty daunting school. Now I can understand the, uh, the physical training and what they would have to go through, but what are some of the academics that they have to uh, go well, through? Well, they literally have courses in the law, penal law, constitutional law, mental health. Um, they deal with it in discussions with almost every type of crime, breathalyzer training, radar training, um, a, a, an awful lot of role playing in terms of how to deal with people. You know, you're hiring people who may have never wanted a sales job before in their lives, yet probably 90% of a police officer's job is sales. You know, when you're trying to move people along, when you're trying to calm that threatening situation, where you're, when you're working with possibly emotionally disturbed people that you need to coax from buildings, it's a sales game. And a lot of people don't realize that when they go into police work. They think it's, well, we're going to write tickets and we're going to arrest people and we don't need to speak in public. We don't need to be able to get our feelings across when in actuality that's a major part of their day is speaking in public. Now, if an individual gets hired by our police department from another agency and they've already gone through the academy, do they have to go through that again or, or is there a, an abbreviated course that they take? What they do is... Uh, Sometimes we are able to, uh, if a person has taken our test, even while they're on another department, they would still have to take our test. They take our test if they've gone through an accredited New York State Police Academy, such as the one we have for Zone 5 in Schenectady. Um, they do not have to go through that at school again. It saves us a tremendous amount of time and money because we now are able to enjoy their services months before we could with a brand new person. Also because they've done some in-service training with another department, we're hoping that they come to us a whole bunch of steps ahead of the game, so to speak. It's still, though, we're still required to bring them up to speed on our standards. And every department has different standards and a different way of looking at things. We like to think that we do a better job than some in terms of the, our level of supervision, our level of making sure things are done right the first time, making sure the paperwork is on time, in the right place, and in the right sequences. So that officer would still, even having gone through the schools, spend two months riding with a senior officer of our department just to learn the intricacies of how to do it our way. Now, once the, uh, the training is done, the, the formal uh, academy training is completed, what's the next step from there? Well, they'll go through, whether it's hiring from another department or hiring and then sending through academy. Uh, if they come on our job from another department, as I said, they'll have a two-month in between a one-month and a two-month in-service training with a senior officer. Somebody coming from the academy has a three-month situation. And they'll typically rotate between the different shifts, between days, afternoons, and midnights. They'll have a short stint in traffic, in communications, in records, in detectives, because they need to know the total function of the police department. Our patrolmen are the most valuable asset we have. We have to give them the right training so that when they take that report, on the street from a crime victim. They need to know how that report goes through our system. 
how it gets from point A to point B, how to advise the people to who to contact in the event that they need to contact someone. So it's very important that during this three months, they're learning about not only how to do their job on the road, but also how to do their job in relation to the other 160 people that we have working with us. And it's very eye-opening to a lot of people. It takes a long time to, to get that person to the point of, at the end of that three-month period, putting them on the street by themselves. And they still get very close supervision, but that's the time that we're now looking at them in terms of how are they actually doing, how are they fitting into the organization, and how are they molding into the community, so to speak, because that's a big part of it. Now, over the past four years, we've had uh, a great deal of, of change and turnover in the police department. We've had a number of people retire. How many new officers have we hired in the past four years? Well, if you look back to prior, just prior to 2003 when this all started, um, and it began by, because of in the 70s and 80s is when our department expanded almost double to what it was in the 60s. And our, all divisions enjoyed this expansion. Well, come 2002, 3, and 4, a lot of the people that come on in the 70s now had their 20 years. They had 25 years, 30, 35 years. And a lot of them decided to retire, which they were able to do under the, the state retirement system for police officers. We had 53 people, literally half of our department, retire over a five-year period. To so, give you an example of the extent of that, in the last four years, we've replaced three chiefs, a deputy, two deputies and a chief. We've replaced five out of six lieutenants. We've replaced 14 out of 14 sergeants. And we've replaced 17 out of 21 detectives. It's a tremendous brain drain on the organization because we've lost almost 1,500 years of experience within the last five years. And with all the, all the changes and all the new people and all the turnover you've had in the police department, things seem to have run, run very well. So obviously, the, the screening that is done through the, uh, the hiring process seems to be working. The training that, that we provide seems to be working. So everything seems to be going along very well. Uh, it all goes back to the first day that they took a test to become a police officer. Our entire hiring process is what protects us from having 53 people retire and then having us fail on something. You know, when you look at the fact that we've replaced all those positions, during that time we've maintained our level of safety in the community nationwide. We're still one of the six safest communities within the country for towns of our size. We've done so with, we have minor blips along the radar screen. There are minor cases with, the, with that institutional knowledge that has left us, okay? There are times when some of the younger people get caught and just don't know how to handle a situation. But you know what? There's always people in the background that can take care of it. But what we were able to do is because we've done so well in recruitment and in hiring, it means we were able to backfill all these positions and really not lose a day work. We were able to get people, very qualified people. You know, it's like a baseball manager. You know, my dugout is full of qualified people. And if we have somebody go out on injury or because of retirement, there is someone that we can pick from the organization that will move into that seat and do just as well, well of a job, and very often a better job because they bring new ideas. And that's one thing that's very refreshing when you do have such movement is it creates new ideas. And that's, in a police department, that's very, very beneficial because too often police departments can be viewed as being archaic and never changing and being too paramilitary. When you have that much change, you'd be surprised how many bright ideas come out of an organization. And it leads you to do different things, to try different avenues, and all that does is make it so that we're a safer town at the end of the day. Now, while all this was taking place, while we were adding new officers to our department, you were also looking at different initiatives. And so while you were training people and bringing new people on, you were doing things in the department to improve the department as well. I mean, we have a, now we have an ATV patrol. We we're working on a new communication system. You brought youth court into the police department. Tell us some of the new initiatives that, that you've started since you've been chief. Well, some of the things that you, you've just mentioned. You know, our town is changing in, in some aspects in terms of population and density and uh, in different areas of the town, and policing changes accordingly. You know, we instituted a bicycle patrol about two years ago. And rather inexpensive thing to do, you, you buy a couple bikes. It costs more for the uniforms than it did for the bicycles. Surprisingly, you've got to send bicycles away for a one-week training. 
to learn how to safely ride a bike in a police type experience. Well, we're now able to take bikes in a neighborhood where we're having a problem, and it puts them directly in touch with the community. It puts them face to face with the citizens. Citizens feel safer because it's not just a car driving by and somebody waving. That bicyclist police officer is on that street, in that park. We use them a tremendous amount of time within the town parks, especially with the crossings of the town park up in the uh, north side of town, because that's the way they can get close to people. People feel safer when they see that officer that close. And it's one of those programs that was very inexpensive to, to start, but it's just another progressive in, in how to progressively handle a police department. The ATVs we talk about. We have still about 40% of our town is undeveloped. And in those undeveloped areas, you know, we have frequent problems with kids on ATVs, adults on ATVs, on snowmobiles. And they can be very distracting and disturbing to the average homeowner who borders these wooded, undeveloped areas. So we actually felt the need, uh, about, uh, again, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, to start a program where we bought two ATVs, the company trailers. We trained our individuals. And now, during the summer months especially, we dispatch them to certain areas, and that's a part of the daily patrol, is to hop on those machines and get into the woods, get into those areas where we've had maybe youth parties or frequent complaints about other ATVs and people annoying, and they're able to make direct contact with these people where that's difficult to do with a full-size police car often. Okay. Now, as, as we talk about the, the bike patrol and the AV patrol, they're, they're somewhat different in that with a bike patrol, the officer is in uniform and he's there in the public and the public sees him as very visible. I've seen them all, quite often at Pop Warner games at, in the West Albany Memorial Park. But with the ATV patrol, that's a little different and it sort of explain um, what you do, how they operate, work with the ATV patrols, as well as there's, there was an arrest made a couple of years ago, and, and sort of explain how that all came about. Well, I think the difference is that the bicycle patrols are designed to be around people. They're designed to be in the parks, in the neighborhoods, um, in streets that maybe we've had some disturbances. For two reasons they're designed for. One is to be a deterrent for, for crime, because now the officer is there, very close to things. He can get in small places. He can get you know, behind buildings if he has to. Uh, very quick response and very visible to the community. One, to give the average citizen a sense of safety that the officer is there. Two, it's just a deterrent because they, actually a bicyclist can move very swiftly when they want to within a small, confined neighborhood, per se. The difference with that to the ATVs is you may never see the ATVs in the course of your career of home ownership in the town of Colony because they're not going to be driving up and down the roads. They're going to be in those areas where we know we have a problem, where maybe they've been a, a, a large nu uh, nuisance and annoyance to people that border those areas. But to those people who border those areas, they're very happy to see our ATVs pull up, drop from the trailer, and brought back into the woods. Because we're taking care of a problem for them, just like that bicycle patrol is taking care of a problem in the park. It's just a different way and a different method of policing. And it's one of those things that needed to change. We needed to incorporate these into our bag of tools, so to speak, because you need to change in policing to keep up with what people are doing. And that was just one of two of the ways that we did it. Now, those officers that are on, on ATV patrol, are they in uniform? They're in uniform, different kind of uniform. Uh, obviously, because they're in wooded areas, they very often don't come out as clean as the day they went in. Um, all, we basically have three uniforms of the day. One would be a typical patrol uniform. A bicyclist uniform is slightly different than the ATV uniform, and the ATV uniform is different from all three. All are clearly identified with police insignias, police across the back of the shirt, police helmets. Our ATVs have the police logos and insignias on it. So we're not trying to be super secret about it. Um, and we also don't want to alarm people because these vehicles and these officers will be in spots that could arouse suspicion if they weren't clearly marked. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen too. Now, have there been any arrests made uh, by the ATV patrol? Yeah, we've had numerous times when either they, one of the funniest things is that you take an ATV patrol officer, you put them in the middle of ATV, ATV trails, and just like clockwork, all of a sudden ATVs appear. Now, obviously it's not in the middle of the day because that's not when the ATVs are out, but typically between four and six at night, that's when young people coming home from school, they're jumping on their own mini bikes or dirt bikes or ATVs, and off they go into the trails where they're not supposed to be. 
And in one case, we just put our ATV, the ATV officer just parked the ATV in the middle of the trail. And they didn't initially see the uniform, initially see the insignia, so we were able to make arrests with them just stopping to talk to what they thought was a fellow rider in the woods. We also had another incident that did involve the, uh, arresting a young man for possession of weapons because he had been using weapons in the woods and he was, he was encountered by one of our ATV officers in the course of the day. So it has been a very worthwhile program. It's never going to create a situation when you're making hundreds of arrests a year. But you are taking an element and changing it for the better for the people who live around that area, for the people who maybe frequent the trails in a walking area, and all of a sudden ATV comes zooming by. So it's all designed to, to hopefully make the, the town a little safer for the citizens. So if any residents have any, any concerns about uh, people riding ATVs in their neighborhoods, they could always contact the police department, give them a location, and, and you'll send a patrol there? Absolutely. Because there's so much um, the undeveloped area in the town, we can't just send them out and just go all over the place. So we need people to call us and tell us we have a problem. You know, we have this problem with these people behind us. They're always on the ATVs. They, they're disturbing the neighborhood. And we actually put them on a list so that when the ATV officers go out, they go out specifically to hit targeted areas. And that's what police work is all about. You know, we use that targeted area approach, whether it comes to uh, juvenile crime, adult crime, burglaries, robberies. You know, we need to know approximately what's going on. We get that information from the citizens. We're able to parlay that into crime statistics, which then changes our deployment on a daily basis and how we move our people around. You know, the days of being static and just saying, okay, this is what we're going to do every day for 365 days a year, that just doesn't work anymore in police work. Okay. What are some of the other initiatives that you've taken on over the past well, one years? Well, one of the biggest things that we've uh, handled and is almost near completion is uh, the purchase of a $6 million radio system. You know, our old system that we're dealing with now was installed in our new buildings back in 1991. At that point, they predicted its uh, longevity at about 10 years. We've got almost 16 years out of it. It's to that point where it needed to be replaced. And that's a process in and of itself. It was a committee that sat for almost two years that developed bids and specifications and the technology that had to go along with it, interviewing companies. Uh, Motorola was the one who eventually won the bid. And it's been a year and a half long process now getting it installed. It's an all new digital system. What a lot of people don't understand is our radio system not, doesn't just serve the police department. It serves EMS. It serves all of local government within the town of Colony. It serves the 12 volunteer fire departments. It serves both school districts. Almost 1,200 radios attached to our radio system. So it's a huge endeavor. The town was uh, able to pull it together. It's coming under budget, uh, not by a whole lot, but it has come in under budget, and it should be up and running by the first, first quarter of 2008. Okay. And what about some of the other initiatives? Um, one of the latest things that we just uh, literally just turned it on within the last week, um, we feel that we're one of the most progressive agencies in providing uh, not just customer service, but the legitimacy of what we do, how we do it, and that we treat people right. We have now just installed a video system throughout our entire building in terms of almost anywhere where a prisoner walks or where a prisoner would be interviewed or a prisoner would sit, those areas are under videotape surveillance now. And we do that for a number of reasons. One, to ensure that we can look back a, a month from now, two months from now, if there's a complaint that possibly a, a person was mishandled, um, we can now track it by video. We're also videotaping within our interrogation rooms. We're one of the first departments in the Capital District to do that. And that was partially through a grant with the DA's office. Because, you know, the American jury now is looking for videotape. They're looking for forensic evidence. They're looking for DNA. And they don't necessarily believe you anymore. When you get in the stand and say something, they want to see it. So they're going to be able to see our interviews from now on um, with, our, with our people charged with serious crimes. And likewise, if somebody were to make a complaint against one of my officers, the videotape will tell whether it in fact is true or not. It will save us a tremendous amount of time. When we get a complaint, we take all complaints seriously. We assign investigators to investigate it. We could have 100 man hours into a false complaint. And what the video system will do is it will probably reduce that to about a two hour time where we'll be able to see firsthand how a person is treated. We're also going to use it with the permission of the PBA. They've been very cooperative with this whole thing because they know they have nothing to hide. We have excellent police officers. We have a tremendous police department. Um, we're going to use this quality control that the supervisor will be pulling 
an arrest a month from every officer and just reviewing that arrest to make sure that they follow safety procedures, to make sure they follow the procedures in our own department handbook in terms of how to handle a prisoner, how to interview a prisoner, all for the sake of making things better. And that's the whole intention of the camera system, is to turn uh, what could be a negative sometimes into a very, very positive. It's a great training tool. Well, when you can take a, we have some tremendous interviewers, and it's hard to explain to a new officer how to interview. It's a lot easier to explain when you can sit down, put a CD into a videotape, a, a video recorder, and watch it. And watch how an interviewer works, watch how the conversation unfolds, and watch how you get to your desired result. Okay. Now that I know there have been some other initiatives with um, concerning youth court, um, trying to think of some of the other, uh, maybe... Uh, with the communications as well. Tell us a little bit about Youth Court and, and well, what happened there. Youth Court started as a not-for-profit uh, in 1992 um, and it enjoyed almost 12 years of status as a not-for-profit as an alternative sentencing method for, to handle with youths and first-time offenses. It's a recognized program from the Albany County Family Court System. It is a nationally renowned program. Our youth court is used as a model across the country now in terms of how it should be set up and how it should be handled. And very simply, it's a youth court of peers. And when your son or daughter would possibly make a mistake and commit a minor crime, you'd have a choice to waive going into criminal court or waive going into family court and have youth court handle that. What it does is it keeps the name out of the system, a permanent system like criminal court. But one thing you have to do is admit your guilt because all youth court does is determine sentencing. And it's a, a panel of your peers who sit and listen to the crime that the young person committed and they actually go and deliberate and the community service hours that are assessed has been as low as two and as high as 305. Our town has benefited from almost 35,000 hours of community service from youth court. What types of community service do they do? They uh, do anything from working at the food bank, they've worked at the Prine House, they've worked at functions that the police department has sponsored, that uh, they've worked at the crossings uh, after the Harvest Fest per se, where they've helped out, helped out setting up tables, chairs. They also go through training. They go through anger management training, they go through drug resistant training, they go through uh, pet larceny training in terms of why not to do those things. But in addition, they all have to come back around through the system and sit as a jury, uh, sit on a jury. So they all know at the end of the day they're going to pass judgment on someone else. And you would think that it would, it would be one of those programs that would you know, last a year or two or go away. Typically, we handle about 100 cases a year through it. It's a tremendous, tremendous civics lesson. We've done almost 1,000 defendants in the system. We probably had a total of between 2,500 and 4,000 kids involved in a program since 1992. It gives people a sense of belonging in the community. It gives the defendants a sense of being treated very fairly by the peers. It gives victims a sense of belonging because we actually take better care of the victims in youth court than they would if they had the case go to criminal court. What happened about three years ago is the funding ran out for the not-for-profit. And I made a proposal to the town board to take over youth court as another part of the town police department. It's a big step by the town board to do so. In these days, a budget, you know, um, uh, budget, tough budget times. Uh, but it was made, a decision was made. We were able to get a grant from the uh, Office of Children and Family Services that covers about half the budget. And it is now a functioning part of the police department in terms of uh, just another way that I think we in the town and county do things better. And it is not open just to town uh, residents. If you're arrested and you're a resident of the city of Albany, your family can come up just as well as a family from the colony. I believe 98% of the, the kids that, that end up going through the youth court system don't get in trouble again. Well, it's not only that they don't get in trouble again. I think the, the, the greatest success to the program is that if you're charged with a minor crime and you go to adult court or you go to family court, because it's minor, the court has a tendency to doing anything you can do to get your case out of court. And very often, the only thing the young person gets out of that is not much happened to me. What this does is the town of county is able to benefit in a number of ways. One is the community service. 
And surprisingly, even with families from out of town, even with families that have to take a cab every Saturday to our police department for community service, we've had a 99% completion rate of all community service. And that's a tremendous statistic. It means that families do care. It means that kids are being brought to the attention of the authorities, but they're being treated in a very fair manner, and that there is a penalty they pay, and that there is a public apology that they need to make. And you know what? It works. And we don't see a lot of these young people coming back again later on in life. Or if they are, they're coming back to thank us for having the program. We've had young people graduate this program that went on and became lawyers, went on to hold position of power in governments throughout the United States. And it's just a compliment to everybody involved, including the original committee, the original board of advisors that actually set that program up. That was a compilation of judges, police officers, community citizens, uh, federal prosecutors that all said, you know what, we need to do something different. And I think that's what the significant thing about the town has always been. We're not afraid to try different things. And some work, some don't work, but in this case, I think we need to look at youth court, look at the ATVs, look at the bikes, look at this video system of all positive things that are just lead, lead us to greatness on a day-to-day -day basis. See, that's one of the con contributing factors that, that keeps us as one of the safest communities in the United States. If, if you can intercede, at a young age, when, these, when these, these children are very impressionable, at that point, they understand and they learn. They learn the lesson, and uh, at that point, uh, you know, they, they straighten out, and, and you never see them again in well, trouble, I, getting in trouble again. You can look at statistics across the country. If you can keep kids out of trouble, your overall crime rate will be low. Because let's face it, kids grow up to be adults, and if they continue committing crimes, typically the crimes get more serious. Mm -hmm. And typically that has a huge impact on a community. You know, when you look at our designation as the sixth safest community, and I've always been one, we take credit for being a great police department, but you know what, it's the total community that, that, that melds into that. If you didn't have good parks, if you didn't have good school districts, if you didn't have good after school programs, before school programs, if you didn't have a good youth center, if you didn't have a good youth bureau, if you didn't have all these things, okay, we wouldn't be the sixth safest community in the United States. It's not just the police department, it is the, it's the mm -hmm. entire Absolutely. aura that creates that safety factor. You know, when you have a safe feeling, it generates more safe feelings. It generates a community that is just into itself, that, that in itself prevents crime. Because the best way to not become a victim is to not act like a victim. Mm -hmm. And we see it across the board that you know the more positive things you can do from youth to seniors, the less victims you have, and obviously if the less victims you have, the less crime you have. That's why as a town we're, we pride ourselves in being very proactive and innovative in, in a lot of these programs that we offer. Are there any other initiatives that uh, you'd like to, uh, to talk about that you've take, undertaken in the police department? Well, I think the, um, when we look at our deployment, and these are things that we keep pretty close to vest, okay? But, you know, we do a lot with our investigation of licensed premises, of adult clubs premises. We have really teamed up with fire prevention, with the building department, in looking at abandoned structures. We look at it, try to do a total team effort in terms of, it's not just the police department doing these things. It's what can we do with other departments in town government or county or state government to ensure the safety of our citizens. You know, our traffic division is award-winning traffic division in terms of dealing with stop DWI causes, but also in seatbelt violations. You know, a lot of people say, well, why do we waste time writing seatbelt tickets? Well, you know, if you look at across the board between seatbelts, safer cars, and airbags, we don't have that many fatal accidents anymore. Where you, we used to average 15 to 20 when I was a patrolman in the 70s and 80s, we're some years now that we have one or two fatal accidents. We have more pedestrian fatal accidents now than we do vehicle uh, fatal accidents. And the bad, the sorrowful thing about that is most of our pedestrian fatal accidents don't involve drunken drivers. It involves alcohol with a pedestrian, but not with a driver who hit the best pedestrian. But we've had a huge problem to where we actually three years ago had posters made up to put in every public establishment on Central Avenue warning people about the right way to cross the street. You know, we've taught our kids, our children know that you don't run across the street. We tell our kids not to ride the bikes across the middle of the road. But our average age of a person being killed in a pedestrian accident in this town was 37 years old. 
and there were people just walking across the street. So, as I said before, we need to bend. We need to be able to be flexible. We're very mobile in terms of what we do. And we try to make it so that uh, we know that we get input from all our people within our department. So if we've, somebody has an idea, we do it. You know, when we look at our target program, that's a teenage alcohol-related gathering enforcement team program designed to go find kids having parties in motel rooms, designed to go find kids having parties at their parents' house when their parents are out. Because we found that people were getting injured, killed, causing serious damage, okay, for these unsupervised events. So we developed a team concept to that, and we went and did it. See, that's been, a very good point, because if, if, a, if a resident in a neighborhood sees a party taking place and knows that the parents are on vacation or away for the weekend, a, a call to the police department is very important. Yeah, because I'll be honest with you, the ramifications of that simple party that people may make an excuse to say, well, it's just kids, it's part of growing up, they're just having fun. Unfortunately, what we see within teenagers, especially teenagers drinking, is they drink to excess. They don't have a social cocktail or two. There's binge drinking is often associated with it, and too often driving afterwards is associated with it. And we've seen too many accidents where kids are seriously injured or killed. We've seen too many times when they've created extensive damage on their way in or out of a neighborhood. We've seen times when as much, uh, we know, I know one example where a house sustained $30,000 worth of damage because their teenagers had four or five friends over. It became 200 friends and they actually realized they didn't like the walls between the rooms anymore because they couldn't fit the kids in the room so they moved walls within the house. So these things really do happen and they happen in colony just like they happen anywhere else. And that's why we have this team of officers that will go out on weekends especially around prom time, graduation time, start of school time, start of vacation time, because that's when we most often see a lot of these big gatherings. And it's, we're not looking to do it to get kids in trouble. We're looking to do it to save an awful lot of anguish and aggravation in the event something goes wrong. Now, if, if residents want more information about the police department, obviously the first place I'd direct them to is our town website. Yeah, we have a tremendous website. We have a very up-to-date website. We're actually the first department within New York State that included information on sex offenders on a website. So people can go to our website. There's links to the state system. But they can contact almost everybody in the department by going to the website. Uh, that website will also have the different divisions and who works where. It will have phone numbers for the supervisors of those different divisions. And, you know, we urge people. We know that we're not perfect. We know that sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes our officers will make a mistake. We urge people to call us and tell us. We can only correct things as we go along by having people comment to us. Now, we also want them to comment when it's good news. And we get a lot of nice letters from people where our officers never even realize no, how much of a difference they can make in a person's life just by handling that police call properly. So we get a lot of letters like that. We get a lot fewer letters where maybe one of our officers missed a call, so to speak maybe didn't give the right advice, maybe was viewed as being a little too authoritarian, and that seems like our major complaint now, is that people are told the right thing, they just don't like the way in which they're told. But you know, we want to know that. We typically, when we get a complaint like that, we'll pass it down to the shift commander involved so that they know firsthand what their officers are doing. They'll reach out and personally contact the person that called and complained, and we will take it up with the officer because we look at it as more of training. And we know that people are going to make mistakes. We know that they can't know everything about the law. They're often asked on the street an awful lot of very technical questions about that even lawyers don't know. And they give their best advice at the time, and sometimes it's wrong. We want to know if they've done that so that we can correct them. It's a part of training. We believe in training every day. And we know the more we can train people, the more that we can do a better job and produce a better product. Now, if people have any additional questions, they can always call the police department. Yeah, one of the best ways is through the website. We, all our superior officers have email addresses that people can contact them through. But knowing that everybody has computers, 783-2744 uh, is our main police non-emergency number, and we ask people to only use 911 for emergencies. But 783-2744 is our main number. Um, that the operators there are communicators. They can direct them to the appropriate division, um, and that's probably one of the 
best ways to get to us. Or in the phone book, a lot of the times the different directories, or the directories have all the different numbers for all the different divisions there. So it's very important that people know that we are accessible. We look forward to their phone calls. I talk to probably hundreds of people a month who just are calling to comment on the service that we give. We're very fortunate. Most of the time it's very positive. When it's not, we make those changes to make it better. Chief Hyder, thank you very much for being on Colony Close-Up. Um, the information you provided is very informational, very informative. And again, if any residents have any questions or concerns, please at any time contact the, the police department. So and I thank you very much for watching this uh, episode of Colony Close-Up. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.